Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane. I'm a psychotherapist, author, and the originator of the Awareness Integration Theory. And hello to Sean, our director in studio. This is a show about what matters most in our life, our mind, our thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. In this show, I will share the tip of the week about how to feel blessed with all the little matters in our relationships and life and ways how to go from misery to feeling blessed. And I feel blessed and honored to have Dr. Behnam Tabrizi with us today. Dr. Tabrizi um, is a world-renowned expert in organizational leadership and transformation, best-selling author, and an award-winning teacher, scholar, and global advisor. Um, he's at Stan Stanford University Director, Executive Program, and Faculty. He has authored six books on leading innovation and change. His latest book, The Inside Out Effect, a Practical Guide to Transformational Leadership is an international bestseller and was featured by the Washington Post as its best book on the subject of leadership. That's what we're going to talk about today. He has advised thousands of global CEOs and leaders in the wide range of industries, including high tech, Apple, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, any of the big ones you know banking and finance, retail, healthcare, and more importantly, as an advisor to the President of the United States, his cabinet and the top leadership team of the European Union. We're going to talk about transformation and how to transform your company. In the midst of it, you might even learn how to transform yourself. But first, here's the tip of the week. <music> The tip of the week. There are times in life that all we look at are what bothers us, creates inconveniences, agitates us about our partner and people around us. We tend to want to change what is not to our liking and zoom in how it is not okay and ways that need to change. Obviously, in order for us to grow, we look at what is not okay or enough. We also hold an expectation of our surroundings to be the way we like. Therefore, when people don't act the way we want them to, or the environment does not give us what we want, we tend to focus on all that is wrong. This way of viewing the world and opening in life holds us in a place of resentment, struggle, and misery. I've been speaking with couples and that all they see is what they don't like about each other and still choose to stay in the marriage. I've spoken with a parent who is so angry at her son for not behaving the way she wants that she yells and screams at him all day while not letting him move out. I've been talking to a man who hates his job so much that he wakes up being miserable every morning. And I talked to a woman who cries all day and says life is unfair. That she just wishes she was dead get the point. When I ask why aren't they leaving, every time I get the positive sign, the blessings, the greatness, or even all little good stuff that makes them stay. And then the butt shows up with all the negativity again, as if we're all trained to fall right back into focusing on all that is wrong and wanting something to change out there. Sometimes when things are taken away from us, we begin to see their value. When we start looking at the person not being in our life or health compromise or a job that is taken away and so forth, we begin appreciating all the small things that were there that made it pleasant in so many ways while we concentrated on all the wrong things. So creating change does not have to come from a state of lack, not enough or misery. It can come from appreciating what we have and enjoy a relationship and life while we pursue growth. So as we wake up in the morning, we can begin appreciating all the little things around us, our health, body, home, running water, hot water, food, clothing, car, job, career, relationships, mate, children, parents, siblings, friends, coworkers, in-laws, flowers, fresh air, anything. Even simple matters such as a kiss from our mate, 
hearing I love you from a child, a smile from a barista, someone who gives us the right away when we drive, or a phone call from a friend who wants to share something great in their life. The motivation for change starts from a positive vision of the future. So many just look at the negative and create hopelessness for themselves for any favorable change in the future. When we begin seeing what works, what our strengths are, what resources we have, and what result we want to create, we can move toward creating a positive change. There are also times that when we begin looking at the positive aspects of our relationship and life, we let go of the need to insist on change, allowing for natural stages of relationships work our life to move us through life. Holding gratitude for the greatness and the abundance in our life allows us to pursue change in our surrounding or request change from others in a positive way. It also changes our mood from misery to feeling blessed. For more awareness integration skills, go to my book, Life Reset, The Awareness Integration Path to Live the Life That You Want. Be blessed. <laughs>everyone, I'm Dr. Pujan Zane and I am excited to have Dr. Behnam Pabrizi with us. He is a world-renowned expert in organizational and leadership transformation, best-selling author and an award-winning teacher, scholar, and a global advisor. He has served as a faculty member of Stanford University for the past 25 years, over which time he's written six books on leading innovation and change. His latest book, The Inside Out Effect, A Practical Guide to Transformational Leadership, is an international bestseller and was featured by the Washington Post as its best book on the subject of leadership. Another book by Dr. Tabrizi, Rapid Transformation, was chosen by Business Insider and Get Abstract, which covers over 20,000 business books as their number one book on leadership. He has advised thousands of global CEOs and leaders in the wide range of industries, including high tech, Apple, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, IPM, and HP. Hewlett Packard, banking and financing, retail, healthcare, and government on how to plan, mobilize, and implement transformational initiatives that have lifted leaders' aspirations and created over $23.5 billion in revenue and over $4.4 billion, $2.4 billion in savings. I'm raising it anyway. He's also for the world's uh, most well-known companies. He's also had a privilege of advising President of the United States, his cabinet, and the top leadership team in the European Union. It is an honor to have you with us. Thank you, Dr. Fujian, for your kind introduction and for your invitation. I went over the book and I was really intrigued and I loved it. And I just wanted you to share with us some of, the, uh, some of your research. But before we go through your research, this, the, the word transformation has been already listening for people in a different world. So people in the world of self-growth look at transformation in a whole new way or a different way. People in business look at it in a different way. Can you share with us when you use the word transformation and when you're working with the concept of transformation, transformation what do you mean by that? That's an excellent question. And, uh, you know, there and what, what I do is I juxtapose transformation versus incremental change in organizations and transformation is really a quantum leap improvement in the mindset of people in the culture of the organization in the outcome of what the organization is trying to achieve if you whether you're a nonprofit for profit so it's really about changing the game it's a restart and rethinking and often we sometimes say starting with a clean sheet because what I've noticed in organization, if you're only engaged in incremental changes, by the way, the job of every manager, every leader is to do incremental change. But if you continue on the path of incremental change, after a while, the organization could be incrementally going to different direction. And so transformation is a reset where you bring everyone together 
you you clear up exactly where you want to go and you you change mindset but at the same time you change processes you change understandings and oftentimes you even break the boundaries that often exist in organizations so you look at a culture that an organization holds and then attempt to shift the culture from like you said in your book and inside out what are the uh concept when i read your book um you talked about the reasons why transformation fails and uh, part of what you were um, alluding to had to do when managers and leaders sit down together and they want to change a culture, um, it kind of like only lands at that point. There's a lot of assumptions that they do about their worker, about their customers, and um, they make a, a decision here without necessarily look at, in reality, checking, viewing, talking, to the employees, um, you know, the mid-management or even their customers. And that is why one of the reasons that you also said that transformation many times fails. Um, could you elaborate on that and other aspects of why you think and in your research have found that transformation fails? Yes, I mean, you, you really put your finger on the most critical element of cultural transformation because number one, uh, there are two things I realized. Uh, one is that often organizations underestimate what it takes to change the culture of the organization. Um, second is that uh, what the managers, as you said it uh, very eloquently, what the managers or leaders say their culture is, is not really actually what's going on. What's going on is at different levels of the organization, whether it's the mid-level managers or the front lines, because at the end of the day, what customers really see are the frontline employees often, and they don't get to uh, rub shoulders with the leaders. So the frontline employees, the middle-level managers really know what's going on in the organization. So oftentimes when uh, leaders tell me, these are what's wrong with our culture, or this is what the culture I like to see, uh, there are two questions I asked them. And number one is, you know, potentially you could be wrong. Are you interested to know what is really going on? And I think that provokes them. The second thing, and I think the most important thing I also tell them is that the culture would never transform unless you as an individual are willing to transform. So that usually surprises them because they say, well, you know, uh, uh, how do I do that? And I say, well, part of this process, as we're trying to put this in motion, you got to be open, you got to show vulnerability, and you got to be open to your own blind side, because people watch you, whether you like it or not, and how you show up, it also makes a difference. So culture has a lot of nuances. And so, uh, and it's important to also let them know that it takes some time to actually transform the organization. This is not a switch where you turn on and off. And one last thing, which has really surprised me about culture, having spent 25 years in this area, is that depending on where you go in the organization, there are actually different cultures. So some organizations might actually, you know, in their for engineering, there's a completely different culture than in the sales organizations. And the way they see this, their mindset and so forth is quite different. So acknowledging that I think is also very critical. Um, I need to share something with you, which is very interesting because uh, many times when people talk about these uh, and some of the companies that you, you were uh, consulting and uh, some of the conversation appears that we're only talking about huge organizations, but this type of a cultural, even in a mom and pop organization, even in a small organization, um, has the same kind of concepts and conversation. I used to run an agency where I had 60 type of therapists and uh, different multicultural, multilingual therapists. And uh, we were offering therapy in five you know, locations with supervisors and all of that. And um, you know, how it started was I had interns and you know, it, it just grew. It just, everybody came in, they just said, we, we heard, heard about this and we love. And, 10 years fast forward, um, I saw some of these therapists who had been coming from like, um, you know, their st students and then kind of like getting raised in this culture. And they were the one who I thought they were created the culture of the whole agency, you know, talking and being negative and then, you know, creating this concept. And I, as the leader of the company, 
was shocked, Dr. Tabrizi. They're like, oh, what happened? And I was so off for a long time. And it was like, it was, everything was collapsing as if it was like my children finally, like they were all, you know, going about it in, in against me. And it was like, well, very personal. And at what point what, we all sat down and finally talked and it's like, this is personal. How come this is so personal? <laughs> and then I got it that to me, these were my children and I had created a culture that I was their mommy. So they had expected a mommy. And then well, as the organization grows, I can't be a mommy, I'm a head of an organization and I got to look at 10 different things. And it was shifting these aspects of, okay, I'm no longer a mommy. You guys are grownups. You are all have your license in, and these are what you have to do. And it had to be such a different conversation from me to them and them to me and taking all these personal things we thought about out for it to become a proficient agency to move away. So as you were talking, that whole you know, history showed up for me. And I'm like, I want our listeners and audience to really know that these, uh, the, your book and the points that you're bringing, it can be in a small mom and pop organization all the way to a multi-billion dollar you know, international organization, and it could fit. Yes, and you know, I, I wish my leaders were as open and as uh, understanding uh, as you in terms of finding this, uh, this equilibrium between what you thought was going on versus what the employees were doing. And I'm sure your background in psychology really helped you because oftentimes what I really see in organization is, is the psychology of this is really challenging. But at the same time, there's also a sociological aspect of this, even within a 60 people organization, is how do you create a movement? How do you get people involved? How do you kind of reset the organization? Because even with the 60 people organizations, you actually have a hierarchy. And oftentimes as the leader, uh, the, the people who report to you may not tell you exactly how things are going. So part of what we do, whether it's 60 people, but most cases there's 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, is we try to really create, create a flat organization where the leader gets to actually rub shoulder and listen to the people who are thought leaders of the organization. And that collapsing of that hierarchy and what I call distance. So part of what I do, I think I finally found out after a quarter century what I do, I collapse the distance between the leaders and the employees and I collapse the distance between the customers and the organization. And once you do that, magic happens. So when you say that you collapse it and they rub shoulders, I'm, I'm hearing you say that there is a, a space of communication and conversation that opens that appears to be equal. And in that space, the customers and employees uh, will be heard and know that they're part of the decision making and the leaders are also taking this information and making them be a part of the decision making. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Yes, that's perfect. And uh, if I may add to that is think of the current organization as the movie matrix, right? It's got its own ways of its, its, its own dysfunctions, its own problems, its own challenges. So what we do is exactly what you said. Outside of this matrix, we create this space that you talked about. And, and a key ingredient of this space is what Amy Edmondson calls a, a culture of safety. Because I think that safety, without that safety, those employees of yours would not have opened up to you if they fear that they would get punished and so forth. So a lot of what we do is we coach leaders of how to create that safety. And once you create that safety outside that, that matrix, <clears throat> we really create a flat organization where we create teams of people, teams of uh, thought leaders across this flat line, and they report directly to the leader or leaders that are kind of like a, in a group. So you really have one level organization. Sometimes I call bringing Silicon Valley inside because part of Silicon Valley success is there's not that much hierarchy, there's a lot of interaction. And in this new, new environment, we create a new culture. We, we give confidence to these people. And one of the things that truly, truly satisfies me is when I see these people 
who are unsung heroes of the organization, and, and there is a process of how you pick them and so forth, they actually gain the confidence because they kind of see the executive and senior executives and you take away those distance and how much that confidence helped them in their promotion, in their future. And oftentimes I hear how it made a difference. So once these people kind of get promoted and the organization becomes more equitable is what really brings a lot of joy to me. And then what you do at toward the end of the transformation is, and, and by the way, you also open the door for people within this matrix to join and to help. So you expand this as much as you can, but the daily work of the organization needs to happen. For example, in your environment, they still have to see the patient because you have to pay the bills, right? But at some point we collapse this new, uh, this new model into the organization. We bring these people, we, we promote some of them so that we can transform this matrix because it's, it's, uh, it's Archimedes said, if you give me a lever long enough, I can change the world. I can move the earth. And so we create that lever by creating that force, if you will, so that when we bring them back, that culture gets percolated across the organization. You talked about um, five uh, building block for transformation in your book. And uh, part of what you were explaining was, um, as I understood the second building block where you send, uh, you uh, co-create that with the analysis, behaviors, diaries, surveys, interviews, data analytic, and then you empathize and refine uh, and build, uh, you know, uh, build uh, the prototype of whatever it is with the customers, and then you hear what the customers say, and that's where I'm hearing you saying it collapses all of those, and then based on these uh, feedback, uh, uh, let's say uh, modules or uh, uh, feedback tools, let's say uh, you gain all of that information, and then um, you you also talk on the third block about having each team having the pilot to lead the team um, and create a light kind of light, lightweight governance that focuses and inspires. And then you talked about the volunteer champion volunteer. So um, I heard when you explain, I kind of heard all the five blocks in them, didn't I? Yes, you did. And, and one of the things that I need to really also emphasize is part of what I do is, by the way, I never call myself a consultant because part of the problem with this cultural transformation is that uh, outside consultants bring armies of people inside the organization. They do all the work. They come up with this amazing PowerPoint and then they leave. No one knows what to do with the PowerPoints. There is no mindset change. They also make a lot of money. Uh, let me give you an example. Santa Clara County, which I've been coaching in the past 10 years, it's 2 million people. They cover 2 million people. They take care of a normal population, budget of around $8 billion. Around 11, 12 years ago or more, they hired this large consulting firm. They paid them, um, I think, $19, 20000000 million. And after 14 to 18 months, they left and nothing changed. And that's what, that's, that's the, if you juxtapose that versus what you just talked about. And a big part of, these five blocks is number one is we need to, I really believe that the insiders are the one who can transform the organization. Unless their mindset changes, unless the mindset of the leaders change, nothing gets uh, you know, implemented and nothing works. So for the first thing we do is with the leaders, we come up with a North Star for the organization, a, a, a aspirational a statement where they get really excited. For example, I was working with this hospital and in the hospital, here's their North Star, which really, as, as I say it, I get goosebumps. It's, uh, they were trying to change the patient flow from the time they come into emergency to the time they leave the hospital. They, there was a lot of delays. They didn't have enough capacity to serve the vulnerable population. The, the Obamacare created a huge demand. So they improved this by about 30, 40%, and they were able to take more patients and move them and take care of them in terms of quality and so forth. So one of the things they said is, we wanted to have a patient, we wanna have a patient flow that, that really our, our patients, uh, that, that it, it, world-class patient flow that our patients love and our employees are proud of. Now think about that. 
we're not only customer focused, but we want our employee to be proud. It's a short statement, but it's inspirational. And part of what I do is I try to, as a coach, I try to inspire people to say, you can do better, especially nonprofit, which is much, much harder because you don't have the traditional carrot and sticks and so forth. So the magic of what I do, which I try to share it with everyone so everyone could do it, is I connect that North Star, if you will, with God goes on in people's heart. I mean, people join the organization because they really want to make a difference. So we create a, a vision statement for every employee in the organization, and we connect their North Star, the North Star in their heart, to the North Star of this organization. And then you create this huge alignment. There was one thing that I noticed, and I just want to check it out with you if I, you know, if I noticed it appropriately or not wrong. Um, when I read some of the visions um, in your book, they, and even the one you said it, the vision is a, is a global, a world. Is that, even if the company is local, even if it's like the hospital is a local thing or like a county is a local, but what I noticed is that you create this vision on a global level as if, this is my perception, as if no matter how locally you are, you are part, like every move you make, every vision you have, everything you have is part of the biggest, uh, you know, the bigger uh, picture of the globe. Is that what I understood? Yes, um, it's, it's really uh, the, the, the conversation we have is coming up with the vision statement. And I sometimes push people to do this because uh, their first uh, version, it's not very powerful. And I tell them, you know, my vision statement, it took about 100 iteration to get there. I talk about that in my book. And so what we want them to do is at the end of the day, the most powerful vision statements that I've seen is, is about serving the world, is being of service to others. And that becomes really, really powerful, whether you're a for-profit, non-profit, it's this doing that that makes a difference. The other day, I was a keynote speaker at the key, uh, Thinkers 50, which is the Oscars of management. And this gentleman came to me that I didn't recognize. He had the sign of uh, Best Buy, uh, uh, Herbert Julie. And I, I felt like he was made up being a mid-level manager. He said, I love your talk and so forth. And then I said, well, what do you do in Best Buy? He said, well, I was a chairman CEO of Best Buy. I was involved with the largest transformation. I felt silly because I, I didn't hear about this transformation. But one of the things he said, he said, exactly this is how he transformed Best Buy. And by the way, Best Buy was actually failing and wasn't doing very well. And thanks to him and doing this magical thing of connecting people's aspiration to the aspiration of the organization, going down there to the floor, meeting with every employees and, and really understanding where the problems are. Um, one of the things we've learned uh, after COVID is the importance of frontline. Without the frontline employees, we would have the, the death rate in the US would have been so much higher. And by frontline, I don't mean just nurses and doctors. I mean, the people who actually brought food to our house while we were all just worried about our, our life and our families. So what, what I hope is that we can use this as a lever to really listen to the frontline about what the challenges are, connecting them back to their uh, you know, work. And, and I just recently wrote an article in Harvard Business review and the article was we need a reset after COVID and, and you're the expert in this after COVID we are just the rate of depression especially with younger people uh, the rate of detachment from the work and one of the key uh, ingredients of what you also talked about is that today we have uh, nearly 80% it used to be 85% 80% that are completely checked out at work they really show up, but they're either sleepwalking or they sabotaging progress. And, and since COVID, uh, we're, depending on what study you see, the productivity has gone down. People are actually working harder. They're on Zoom longer, but their productivity is going down. How could you expect people to be innovative, to be creative, if they're not kind of meeting in person? And if they don't really get a break before from one meeting to another, at least you got to walk, you got to you know, breathe some air and so forth. And now it's just one meeting after another. And we're really getting into this burnout mode. 
And again, I think this model could help people to get out of this burn, uh, burnout mode where they could come up with a future that truly gets them excited. How do you see the, uh, the change uh, for many of the companies who um, see that their employees are wanting to stay home and they want to work from home? And, um, uh, you know, coming back to the regular life has become a little bit of a stress for people and going back to actual brick and mortar spaces. Um, I've been talking to many people that say, you know, the, the change was devastating when we had to actually all stay home, but we figured it out finally. It's about a year and a half, so we kind of figured it out after three or four months. I'm not saying that it was all great, but we figured it out. And now that we have to change all of this and go back, and um, it's, it's hard. I don't, like some, some people even have the anxiety of being around people you know, being in a company around people that much or um, having to dress up all the time and, and now have to go into this kind of like the political culture that you would have as a society that you were there versus, you know, when you're home in the Zoom, you don't really get involved a lot with the political aspects of the company and inner politics of the company and socialization. What are your thoughts about this as you, um, as you coach different companies? For this is actually the most important uh, topic that my leaders are, are grappling with. And uh, depending on who you talk to, even within the organization, there are disagreements. Some say, bring them back. I can't get anything done to those like we can't do that. So I'd like to kind of come at this from different angle. One is I've not done the research, but my understanding is most of the millenniums that I know, they want to go back and they want to socialize. They, they're, not, they're not having fun. My experience is most of the older people, they like to work at home and, and uh, whether they just, and, and also depends on what you do. So for example, if you're just a programmer and you're happy being a programmer, yes, you can be anywhere in the world, work from home or work from anywhere and that's okay. But you know, most people are not programmers. Most people are ambitious. Just imagine if you're in your twenties or thirties, you wanna start an organization you don't want to be outside of the organization politics. In fact, you want to be close to where the center of power is so you can get the promotion. I mean, if they have to promote someone, they probably promote someone where they see them on a daily basis more than somebody who lives in another country and they don't get to see them and so forth. So your chance of promotion uh, goes higher and so forth. I, I always uh, say that if you're not invited uh, to lunch, you could be part of the menu. So uh, I try to make power and politics more comfortable with people, especially the ambitious people and say, you just need to learn the game and each company is different. But uh, my, my feeling is where are we gonna land on this? I feel like we're gonna have a hybrid where even the most ambitious people will get to probably stay home one or two days, like the county example, uh, some people were driving one or two hours or three hours to get to work. So I can see them maybe spending one or two days um, at, 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 uh, at home. But there are also some important customer meetings and, and, and uh, that they really want to do face to face where they haven't met the person and so forth. We're definitely going to move to this hybrid model. And depending on the organization, we're going to get different type of things. I still, and I may be a traditionalist, I still love... I have this big office table when my students come in, I see them, I still miss. I mean, I've, I, I was able to push Zoom as far as I can and I can still create a space that's powerful, but nothing substitutes that in-class learning, in-class discussion and so forth. And my guess is some of the basic things would probably be online, but a very deep, deep discussion, very creative type of things, you really need to be able to be close to each other. Yeah, there is a different feel. I still I have a lot of my clients on the Zoom at, at this point, but there's still some people who really want to come to my office and we go, and although we're still wearing a mask, but there's, there's a different energy when we are in the room, definitely. So my next question is, um, uh, because you not only have um, worked with uh, smaller companies, mid-size, large, 
um, and international and um, you know cabinets of political cabinets and, and the president. Um, I really am interested to see what your ideas are about the distinct differences. Sometimes you know um, the, sometimes it's stated that the government also appears to be a company or it needs to run like a company. Other people say it's not a company. It shouldn't be running like a profitable company. And they're like, well, it's a nonprofit organization kind of. And then other words, no, it's just there for service. Um, so if as, as a coach, when you've done all of these different industries, what do you think the differences are as you go into this culture of a small, like what I said, a mom and pop, or you go into a midsize or a large international or uh, a government size, let's say, entity? What do you think the differences are when you have to face the transform transforming those cultures? Yes, I, I, that's really great. Uh, one of the things I want to share with you is that most of, a lot of my career was spent on for-profit organizations. So, and I work with some of the best leaders, uh, Andy Grove, who ran Intel and was Time Man of the Year. I had uh, my early, early career. I had the chance to to learn from him, to be very close to him, and I still have scars from all the tough attitude he brought in. But it made me such a better coach as a result, and so forth. So. Uh, that and, and people told me you cannot survive more than three months with Andy. I was there for like three, four, five years, and uh, and, and so what's that? You got tough skin. Well, I got a very tough skin. And then um, when I wrote my rapid transformation book, um, um, I got a call from the uh, President Obama's transition team. I had the privilege, you know, as an as an immigrant, I had the ultimate privilege of working with the White House, with the team on the healthcare transformation. And, and later I also worked with the county while also working with large organizations such as uh, an organization, a, a big, one of the biggest, the biggest bank in, in, in uh, Thailand, some Chinese companies, some local uh, for-profit companies. And I, 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 I'm gonna share with you what I've learned from working with uh, governmental institution is number one, I've learned patience. <laughs> you really need to be patient. And I was not a patient person. Second thing you learn is because you don't have the traditional carrot and sticks, in governmental institution, leadership matters more, being inspirational. All of this inside out, all of this uh, creating a vision, getting people excited because you know, sometimes people join uh, these uh, for-profit Silicon Valley companies because they want to retire, but nobody goes to government just want to retire. They really want to, a lot of people, especially younger people, they want to be of service. They join healthcare because they want to be service. So I learned more about leadership in the governmental setting than I learned for-profit setting. The last thing I want to say is a big aha for me was that this model that you just alluded to actually is perfect for nonprofits, although it works for profit and it's perfect for profit, but it's even, there's no other model it can work in a governmental institution because unless you get the buy-in from middle-level managers, from frontline, nothing happens. And, and so, because the, everybody has tenure, you cannot fire people. And as, as anyone, your listeners who have been involved with governmental institutions, they're tough to deal with. And I work with the permit department within the county, and we were able to cut down the cycle by about 30%. We changed the culture. We changed the office, which the way office was set up. The customer satisfaction went up by 30%. So there is a lot of you know, excitement and satisfaction I get when I work with governmental institution, although I still work for a lot of for-profits because it keeps me on my toes and it, it helps me be the athlete that I want to be. So both of them kind of help each other, if you will. And there's also some organizations that are between governmental and for-profit. For example, a lot of Asian organizations, to my surprise, they don't want to lay off their people the way the American institutions do. They, they're either labor law problems or out of the goodness of their heart, they don't want to throw their people in the street. So it becomes a quasi-government for-profit organization. Again, this model really works with them. But, but one thing is important is in every assignment, 
I go with beginner's mind. I tell myself, you don't know anything. Don't rely on your 30 year experience. Be ready to learn new things and unlearn the old things and so forth. And that's what keeps me excited about every project because in every project, I learn new things. Um, the next question that shows up for me, uh, I'm very excited because I'm like picking your brain and I love <laughs> The model that you have is uh, a lot about um, valuing employees and for them to experience being valued or the customers being valued as who they are as a human being. Um, some of the corporate culture that uh, especially in, in public companies, which has a formula of, eh, you know, um, every year or every six months, we're gonna make it lean. So this, this you know, so many percentage are just gonna be beheaded. Um, or companies, uh, some banking systems, not naming, uh, mm -hmm. where they started almost, uh, abusing their customers with, um, you know, kind of like just getting them to or keep opening accounts or doing different things where at one point they felt really used. Like the, it appeared that they were doing the surveys. It appeared that they wanted to give service, but, you know, uh, the cat was out of the bag that there was a lot of misuse of their customers too. So when you talk about this transformational piece and you bring it into a company, that has this type of a uh, culture okay. and not one or two it's like it's a very much into this kind of like a public company uh culture right now how do you marry these two concepts from one you know one extreme to the valuable aspect that you're talking about yes i mean that's that's really the biggest challenge in terms of me deciding whether i want to engage with an organization I mean, one thing early on I did is I made sure my overhead is low, our expenses are low, so that I could say no to some, uh, to some uh, people. Sometimes it's very difficult for consulting fir firms. I mean, if you look at the amount of uh, write-up that has been written about McKinsey and their work with rogue governments, the rogue things they did, it's, 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 some of my students work for them and they call me and they feel so ashamed of the work that they do. I think, I think the most important thing is that the coach has the right values and it's very clear about, uh, you know, what, what, what are their values because transformation is like a slippery slope. Once you compromise your values, you're in uncharted territory. And this is what I tell my executives is come up with two or three or four values and never compromise on, on them. And so, uh, one of the things I want to mention is that uh, the question is my conversation with the leader, with the person that I assign as a transformation leader, the key decision maker, because this is something you don't want to delegate. We really talk about exactly what you said, because if I feel like they're not, they're not genuinely don't want to change the context, because I really believe if you change the context, you can change the content, you can change the way people behave. And, and, and so, and also, in, you know, when I write a contract with them, I always say, you know, you should be able to get, get rid of me in a 30 day notice. I like to do the same thing. I like, you know, sometimes we don't fire our customers. And I think sometimes we need to do that as organization. If your values are not shared, if you don't feel right about it. So in most cases, I believe there is hope, but there are cases where their reputation precedes them. And in those cases, I just refuse. And I must say around 2000, 2001, 2002, I really didn't do that much uh, coaching. I did a lot of writing books because most of the people ask me on the rubric of transformation, they were actually laying off people. They were really not transforming minds and hearts of people. They were not interested. Sometimes you need to let go some people, bring some new people. But if you use transformation as an excuse to get rid of people, then to me, that's a danger sign and something that I prefer not to have anything to do with it. Because like I said, for me, it's a calling. And I'm gonna share with you my vision statement because it's something that I haven't looked at, but I always go through it in my head. Um, I stand for uh, unconditional love, infinite and abundant energy, passion and charismatic presence to transform people organizations and countries 
while upholding my highest integrity. This is something, this is kind of like a prayer that I read to myself. And if I'm not doing this, I'm not happy. If I'm doing this, I'm happy. And I tell people, I tell people I work with, I tell my loved ones, my family, my friends, so they catch me when I'm not this because they tell me, hey, you tell me this, but this is not, and I say, you're right, I need to get back because they're also become my co-conspirator and make sure that I'm always doing the right thing. And for some, when you, and then I, I, I want to transform 100 million people before I die. And these 100 million people, my hope is that they transform billions of people. So when you hear something, you know, when, when you believe in this and you have commitment, then retirement goes out the door. Your values are important. And, and you're always excited about doing something that really makes a difference on the lives of people, because that's what really matters. When I was in uh, Thailand, there was this driver that was taking me around and I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to sit down and have coffee. And my translator told me, he doesn't feel comfortable. You're just such a big person, whatever. And I said, no, I want to have coffee. So I, and I said, what is your dream and so forth? He said, you know, my dream is uh, to, uh, to work another two, three years, then retire, take care of my family. And, and uh, my, my passion is, is music. It's not what I do and so forth. <laughs> So uh, after we had this meeting and I talked to him about, you know, maybe those two, three years, there are things you can do to get excited and so forth. I went to a, an executive meeting and I told him, you guys are doing this because of him, because you want to make sure he has this transition he wants to get and so forth. So those are what really excites me about what I do. It's really not about financial or all these accolades that I get. It's a very satisfying uh, area. And I'm sure you get that with your customers and your patients. Well, one of the things that I have also noticed is the same thing when you go to a therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, trust is important. In my case, trust is everything. And, you know, uh, because I work with a lot of people, like at, at one point I might have to work with 50 people, right? And I have to be so careful because somebody reports to someone and both of them come and complain about each other. And, you know, it's a little bit tougher than if you just help one person. So if I mess up this where they feel like I backstabbed them or I went behind them, I will lose all my credibility. And I told them if this happens, I would quit. If my reputation comes to a person like that, don't trust him and so forth. Because oftentimes my CEO brings me in, but... One thing I'm always proud, I never go behind people that I coach and tell the CEO, because once you go to that slippery slope, you lose your entire trust. And that's all this model is, is all about trust. Absolutely. I experience that a lot with family therapy, couples therapy, where, you know, you are kind of confident with a lot of different uh, concepts. One of the things that it's, uh, it's fascinating to me, and I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but uh, what I've noticed is that people... Uh, behave in companies the same way they they behaved in their family. So <laughs> they, you know they create a mommy or a daddy in the company, and they'll have everybody else as a sibling, and they'll do the sibling rivalry, and they do this competition, and they'll go you know to tell mommy or daddy that they created in the company. So and then you can see like people who were from a large company, large. Uh, uh, family systems and you know they were like the uh, the firstborn or somebody how they come into the company and kind of like they take the same concept or there or like the 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 the, um, uh, the only child you know that goes into a company and how they handle every other sibling rivalry as if like why why is this happening so it's a lot of the dynamic that a person kind of grows up and as they move into a company they first uh, automatically they create that as an existence and then obviously they have to learn and kind of like separate so that's something that i've noticed uh between our world between the psychology and that no you're you're absolutely right and i and i i must acknowledge uh, what you do your profession and how much i've learned from this profession a couple of things i've learned um, from psychologists is number one is validation and as human beings, we don't validate enough. And I've learned to validate. Even people say, I mean, you guys have so much patience. You hear the most, sorry to use this word, what comes across may have been the most absurd thing and you just validate them. Doesn't mean you agree, but you validate. The second thing 
I think that I've also learned is that people's childhood makes a big difference in terms of how they show up in the world. So for example, I was working with one leader who had a very tough childhood, uh, lost a, a father, and was the was the was the only man in a, in a, in an ethnic type of culture in in his household, which was barely making it in, in this household, and now he's raised to a high level. And I was coaching another uh, uh, leader who was thinking about firing this person, right? And I didn't want him to fire him because I felt like he's just being too uh, emotional about it. So this is what I told them. I said, you know, I want you to think of him as that little child, that little insecure child that didn't have a father, was a lot he had to deal with. Just acknowledge that, just see that in him. And boy, now they're much closer and so forth, but really connecting to people's childhood and their childhood trauma. And sometimes being able to connect that to who they want to be and understanding their blind spot. I think this is where it was powerful. Adam Grant, who's a professor in uh, uh, Wharton, he actually was, was, was consulting with uh, Melinda Gates and he talked about uh, psychological safety. Melinda Gates said, well, can you help that in my organization? He said, are you sure? He said, yeah, yeah. So they did what you kind of did, but maybe much more brutal. He brought in like several people he sat Melinda on the other side and he said, just tell him exactly how you feel about her. And they were bombarding her with things. And he coached her to just take it well, you know, you know, use this as an opportunity to grow. And according to him, this was the most constructive thing. This actually helped the foundation to grow to a next level. So it's, it's not for the faint of heart when you go through transformation. It's really about getting out of your comfort zone and, and seeing, I, I've never, uh, in the recent last 20 years, none of my transformation has have failed. A lot of it is because it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one type of things. It's also one-on-many and always looking at levers. You know, what are the things if I pull, I can have 10x improvement in the outcome. So I always think about the brilliant basics. What are one or two things that now I can focus on? Because I'm a coach. I see the whole team going on. I see the whole soccer game. I see all the 11. And I said, maybe we need to change this to make a difference. And so given this psychology, it's like a very complex problem solving, if you will. Thank you so much for the time that you've allowed uh, my me and my audience. I've learned a lot from you. I learned a lot from the book. I'm taking it on. I've had a, a mission statement before, but I'm going to take on your way of handling the mission statement and visioning and see how many of them I can come up with, you know, the, the, the different ones until it kind of like lands every cell of my body in that way. Awesome. So everyone, the inside effect, um, inside out effect and a practical guide to transformational leadership by Behnam, Dr. Behnam Tabrizi and Michael Terrell. Um, Dr. Tabrizi, last words. You know, last word is we're all work in progress. You know, and uh, sometimes I, I work in an environment where it's very competitive. You know, it's very, very competitive. And I tell my students that there is a beauty inside of you that you just need to connect with that. Just become a better version of yourself from what you were yesterday. Don't look over your shoulder and don't connect your inside to people's outside. And always, always, always work on personal development and becoming a better person. And don't forget, happiness is about growth and the service to humanity. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Where can people find you? Um, they could connect me on LinkedIn. Uh, they can send me a message on LinkedIn or um, uh, I think that's probably, or they can DM me on Twitter. So those are my two contacts. Is there any website that you have? Uh, I don't have it. I have a company website, but those two, usually I answer my LinkedIn. Of course, there's a lot of requests for this, requests for that. But if they connect with me and it's something I can help them, I'll be more than happy to help your audience or your listeners. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for a great conversation. I really appreciate it.
and for all of you who are out there, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, bye-bye.